As the army prepares to be deployed, it's gearing up to deal with what it calls perception management. It has a, a, a doctrine on military and psychological operations out. And I'm quoting from it. A planned process of conveying a message to a select target audience to produce and promote particular themes that result in desired attitude and behavior which affect the achievement of politi political and military objectives of the country. So, I mean, this is army speak, but basically they are just preparing to use the media to brainwash us into accepting that it's a necessity that the army must be called out. Corporations have their own perception management strategies. And this is what I really want you to listen to very carefully. With a minuscule percentage of their profits, they run trusts, educational institutions, foundations, which in turn fund NGOs, academics, politicians, policy makers, journalists, artists, filmmakers, literary festivals, and even protest movements. They use charity, philanthropy, they like to call it, to lure opinion makers into their sphere of influence. So it's not that they always do bad, bad work, but the thing is that funds are available to these opinion makers to do a certain kind of work. So the, the funds are not available for other kinds of work. They dry up. So those who see through this and don't want this slowly get marginalized and, and really can't, can't work. This is a way of infiltrating normality, of colonizing ordinariness, so that challenging them seems as absurd or as esoteric as challenging reality itself. And from here, it's a very quick and easy step to there is no alternative. When reality has been sufficiently infiltrated, then the logic gets inverted. The practice of charity from being a part-time hobby subsidized by the sort of indecent surplus that they generate becomes the justification for the system that creates the surplus in the first place. Nandan Nilakani, the CEO of Infosys, said quite disarmingly in an interview to Barbara Crossett, to have philanthropy, you need to create wealth. So corporate philanthropy is a bit like the commercial fishing industry. You know, the big fishing trawlers, they trawl the, the oceans in the deep seas with these huge nets, and they drag in tons of fish, not all of which they want, because Western consumers, they only eat select portions of select fish. But the, the nature of capitalism is such, and this, you know, the, the such a frenzy that they cut off the fins of the sharks before the sharks die, and then they throw the, the sort of finless sharks and the fish, the dead fish that they don't want back into the sea, and they take what the first world will eat. It's cruel, but that's the bus that's business. That's what it does. You know, killing the sharks takes too much time. One, uh, but now philanthropy has made its entry into the world of commercial fishing. So the EU fishery chief, Maria Damanaki, told people in Europe and the EU, as a part of sweeping marine reform, that instead of discarding these dead fish at sea, low value fish should be distributed to charities. You know, so not that we should change our way of doing things, we should stop emptying the oceans, but just give these dead, cheap dead fish to poor people. Sweet. Perhaps she could call it the fishy foundation. And a few Somali pirates who are mostly fishermen who've taken to piracy because there are no fish left in the sea could be on the board. Trusts, foundations, and think tanks have a fascinating and secret history. The big ones, endowed by 19th century robber barons, 20th century fascists, 
and 21st century Silicon Valley barons like Rockefeller, Ford, Carnegie, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and others have spawned things like this, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, Chatham House in the UK, the Trilateral Commission, and the Aspen Institute, all of which are very active in India now. And they provide the platform where international, the international platform where bankers, politicians, senior bureaucrats, corporate executives, industrialists, weapons manufacturers, academics, journalists, and NGO workers can do business. Which isn't a bad thing in itself, except that whoever provides the platform calls the tune. And the tune is, and always has been, the anthem of the free market. In the US, where the inspiration comes from, trusts and foundations are called not-for-profit organizations. But their kind of philanthropy is actually the most lucrative business of all. It is the groundwork on which the corporate business empire rests. Because effectively, it privatizes policy making itself. And in India, its potential for this massive dividend, you know, this kind of supposedly missionary activity, the dividends had not been fully understood. So until recently, industrialists were just building temples and so on. But now they've understood it, though the Tatas understood it a long time ago. So other than their educational institutes like Tata Institute of Social Service and Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, they run two of the largest charitable trusts in India. They donated $50 million some years ago to that needy institution, the Harvard Business School. <laughs> the Jindals, with a major stake in mining, metals, and power, run the Jindal Global Law School and will soon open the Jindal School of Government and Public Policy. It's interesting, Naveen Jindal, the CEO of Jindal, he's an MP. He's also the uh, director or chairman or whatever of the National Flag Foundation because he won this case for the right to flag, fly the flag on, on his house. And the Jindal's law school, recently it held a protest workshop. You know, so they flew all these activists and poets and singers to, to kind of demonstrate how to protest to these rich kids in the business school. So, you know, they just lay siege to us, basically. They, they are on the opposition, they're on the business, they're, they're everywhere. Financed by profits from the software giant Infosys, the New India Foundation gives prizes and fellowships to social scientists. The Observer Research Foundation, ORF, endowed by Mukesh Ambani, has retired intelligence agents, strategic analysts, senior politicians from both parties who pretend to fight in parliament but work together on these foundations, journalists, policy makers as its research fellows. So I'm just going to use the example of ORS to talk a little bit about how these foundations work. In its own words, I'm quoting now from the ORF's own publicity. The Observer Research Foundation was started in the early 90s during the troubled period of India's transition from a protected economy to a new engagement with the international economic order. The idea was to help develop a consensus in favor of economic reform. Since then, ORF scholars have made significant contributions towards improving government policies. ORF pro research projects have resulted in an immediate and tangible impact on economic and strategic policies of the country. The foundation's activities can be neatly divided into two categories, projects and events. Both are an intrinsic part of the foundation's objective in shaping, influencing public opinion, and creating viable alternative policy options in areas as divergent as employment gener generation in backward districts. And get this, 
real-time strategies to counter nuclear, biological, and chemical threats. ORF's very first conference, organized in 1991, was inaugurated by the then Finance Minister, now Prime Minister, Manmohan Singh, the apparatchik of the Washington Consensus, and the architect of India's economic reforms. I was a little puzzled about this, you know, this business house's preoccupation with nuclear and chemical warfare. But then, less so when in the long list of its institutional partners, I found the names of Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, two of the world's leading weapons manufacturers. What significant part did they play in improving the Indian government's policies? What exactly were the immediate and tangible impacts on India's strategic policies? In 2007, Raytheon announced it was turning its attention to India. Could it be that a good part of India's $80 billion defense budget for the next 10 years will be spent on weapons, guided missiles, aircraft, warships, and surveillance equipment manufactured by Raytheon and Lockheed Martin? The question here is, do we need weapons to fight wars, or do we need was to create a market for weapons because the, the, econo the, the economies of the countries of Europe, US and Israel depend very largely on the manufacture and sale of weapons and it's the one thing that they haven't outsourced to China. It's the one thing that they still have to sell. When the US President Barack Obama, supposedly the most powerful man on earth, came to India in 2010. He came as little more than a salesman for Boeing. Now here's something to think about. In the new Cold War between US and China, that's being played out in Africa and the Middle East. Not many of us know that when Libya was bombed, basically, 30,000 Chinese workers had to be evacuated because Gaddafi had, not only he had he said he wasn't going to trade in dollars, but he was signing big contracts with China. So in this new Cold War between the US and, uh, and uh, China, India's role is going to be what Pakistan's role was in the Cold War between the US and Russia. And many of the columnists and strategic analysts who are playing up these hostilities with China, you'll see, can be traced back directly or indirectly to the big Indo-American think tanks and foundations that I've just mentioned. And all of us know the history of what has happened to US allies in the past. In, uh, coming back to the Observer Research Foundation, you will also find the names in the institutional partners of Rand Corporation, Ford Foundation, the World Bank, the Ministry of Defense, the Brookings Institution, whose stated mission is, quote, pro to provide innovative and practical recommendations that advance three broad goals. One, strengthen American democracy, to foster the economic and social welfare, security and opportunity of all Americans, and secure a more open, safe, and prosperous cooperative international system. You'll also find in that list the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Poor Rosa, who died for the cause of communism, to find her name on a list such as this one. They say that capitalism is about competition. But economic globalization has shown that it's capable of inclusiveness, promiscuity, and great solidarity. The great Western capitalists have done business with fascists, with socialists, with despots, and military dictators. It can adapt and it can constantly innovate. It's capable of quick thinking and immense tactical cunning. Over the last 20 years, the neoliberal establishment in India has worked out how to manage the government, the opposition, elections, the court, the media, and liberal opinion. 
What remains to be dealt with is growing unrest, the threat of people's power. How do you domesticate it? How do you turn protesters into pets? How do you vacuum up people's fury and direct it into blind alleys?